You're listening to Raising the Bets, a family podcast of pirates and penguins. We're a Catholic family raising five kids outside of Boston, sharing the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, our adventures near and far, making sense of the world, and experiencing the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Uh, and I really have to work on that opening. I'm not sure that's the best way to describe the podcast. I'm trying to figure out what the best way to describe what we're talking about is. And that's, uh, I don't know, you know, making sense of the world, experiencing the culture. It could be a little punchier. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to work on that. Maybe maybe listeners can let me know if you if you send me an email to bets at sqpn.com. You can, you know, give me some suggestions for how uh, I can improve the opening and what you think. Disc- how you describe the show so far? We're we're five episodes in. This is our fifth episode. Five already. Already. This is wow. we've done. <laughs> that's right. No, this is fun. It's funny how quickly these accumulate. That's yeah, hard to believe. <laughs> so I do want to uh, sh- give a shout out, a thank you to, and it's a, 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 a too waited too long to thank because thank Victor Lamb for making our theme music. Uh, we had a different uh, music for the first episode, uh, and then Victor uh, offered to write us some jaunty pirate music. Um, I'm not actually sure that I've listened to it yet. All right, well, I, well, I think you can I, play it for me later. I will play for you afterward, uh, but the, everyone else has already just heard it. Right. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm missing out somehow. I'm, when I play it, you will remember that I played it for you. It's got the, the, the seagulls in it. I don't remember any seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it is it is quite memorable, I think. Okay. I mean, anyway. I, I'm, sure I, I'm sure I will recognize it when you play it. And me. actually, I go back almost 20 years with Victor online. Uh, we were both early uh, Catholic bloggers. And, uh, and I forget what Victor's blog was. But uh, so, and then we lost touch and then... Uh, He's he he's actually does some editing for our some of our shows uh, as a volunteer uh, sound editor. So I'm really greatly appreciative of Victor for uh, all his help, but especially right now for that theme music for the show. So um, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what's been going on with us the last week. I really feel like this week has been kind of slow and dead. And when you reminded me that it was Friday and we're supposed to record, I said. I don't think I have anything to say about this week. <laughs> but then you reminded me that we did actually do a, a few things this week. There's a couple of things. I, so what I do is I make notes through the week and say, oh, this is something we should talk about. Oh, this is noteworthy. So because that would happen to me, I would forget too. But it, it's nice to have this because it makes me reflective on what we're doing and, and, and what's going on in our lives. So it's a very it's a nice record for us and even for our kids. In the future, it might, our grown kids who are listening to this, or our grandchildren who listen to this, uh huh. <laughs> All right. So what have we done? So we had uh, last Sunday we had our Cub Scout crossover event. Uh, so for those of you who aren't involved in uh, scouting, uh, especially Cub Scouts, at the end of the year, which is because everything the kids do these days is is by school year, not by calendar year, uh, or we could just go with fiscal year. Let's go with that. Uh, <laughs> But at the end of the year, all the kids cross over to the next rank. And with Cub Scouts, they cross over by age. So even if you didn't earn the badge, you move up to the next level. So Ben is a second. It was a first year we below. He's now a second year we below. Anthony was a wolf, and now he's a bear. And but he's very excited about being a bear. Very excited about being a bear. I mean, he was pretty excited about being a wolf last year. And now he can be a bear. It's even bear bears are even better. Well, because he saw a live bear a couple of weeks ago. I think that's that makes it better. Yeah. So he uh, but the other thing we do is so this year we had it in a park uh, nearby. It was much, much better this year. Last year, it was at the parking lot, the church parking lot of the church where the where the scouts meet. And it was hot yeah. and it was kind of boring. And this was nice. It was it was on a pond. Sophie and I went through for a walk through the woods and we saw a snake and there were geese and ducks. It was a dam. A dam. Yep. Yeah, we, we took the dam tour. Took all the dam and, we wanted. And we had a bonfire. <laughs> and a fire. A yes. fire. Yeah, they, and there was food. They had you know, burgers and dogs and they had a bonfire because it's scouting. You got to have a bonfire. And chips and cupcakes so the kids could, you know, really sugared up. Yes, and salted up. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and it was, so it was at Pond Meadow Park, which is in the next town over Braintree. And for one thing, it was I, I was 
the directions there were kind of sketchy. There was a there was a sign for Palmetto Park when I pulled in. I didn't see anybody cars that I recognized, and so we we drove off and came back, and there was like there's a road down here. And it, I mean, I thought it was a walkway at first. And it was a road into the park. And so we started driving down this road and we drove and we drove and we drove. And the road got narrower and, and narrower. narrower. Then it became dirt. <laughs> right. And at this point I'm going. I... We're, and we're going like back out into the, like into the woods. Like there's no. Yeah. Deep. Yeah. In the, like in the middle of the suburb. Like but this is a big, big park. And then suddenly it, we turn a corner and come down a hill. And there's there's where all the cars are. There's a dam. And then there's a big open area with where the, the picnic tables and stuff. And that's where everybody was. But uh, so at first I was like, where are, where are we going? Are we going to get stuck out here? Because we're driving the big van, too, which is, you know, the big van. So but the, the crossover was nice. The kids got to play a little wiffle ball with the other kids and sports with for our kids is unusual. <laughs> but it was it was a, it was good. Right. Right. It was fun. Yeah, it was a nice. I, I was I was not really looking forward to it. Remembering last year. When I also didn't really feel great last year, so yeah. this was much better. Yes, it was good. It was a good time. So uh, we didn't do much else this week. It's been kind of warmer, and we just had a hard time getting out of the house for some reason. One of the things we want to talk about was, we, t- we talked about before about Isabella doing this adventure camp. And, and my brother, hey, Stephen, who says that he's now listened to all the episodes, said that he wanted to know more about Isabella's adventure camp. She's waving at you, Stephen, even though you can't see her. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Bye. Uh, yes. So he wanted to hear about more about Adventure Camp. So Isabella wrote a narrative about Adventure Camp, sort of from the point of view of the character she was playing, right? Right. So so this was uh, the official The title of this camp is uh, Live Action Wilderness Survival. And so it borrows heavily from other of uh, the format as live action role playing games, if anybody's familiar with live action role playing, like Dungeons and Dragons, but out in the woods, right? So they, you know, you create a character and you give them a backstory, and then you give them like a uh, specialties. Uh, Isabella decided that she wanted to be a healer and a busker. <laughs> That's so awesome. And so, so the, the the activities she tended to focus on were were those kinds of activities: going out in the woods and identifying plants that could be medicinal an actual plant like medicinal plants like not just pretending that these plants are medicinal right, right. but that was part of the, the the shtick was that they would they were learning about this stuff right yeah so so while they're doing this live action role playing the adults who are the leaders are actually teaching the kids wilderness survival skills one day isabella made a fire and it was on the day that it was raining so she was very pleased with herself that she got a fire going in the rain that's awesome in the rain yeah i don't think i could uh, there's there's a guy who teaches them um, unarmed combat, like martial arts fighting. They call him Guru um, in the game. And uh, they, they, they do cooking over the open fire and uh, all sorts of other activities. They, they made uh, foam swords one day. Yep. And uh, so she writes in one, in one of her things that she they gathered forest wild geranium, moss, ferns, jack in the pulpit, violets, pine needles, lady slippers and other medicinal plants then they caught salamander eggs tadpoles and a toad and then found deer footprints that's all just like one morning that they did this right. sadly she didn't really remember what the medicinal purposes for the various plants were <laughs> but she, you know hopefully over time that those things would come back to her you know that cold cracker bushcraft uh channel the youtube channel i watched the guy who's the bushcraft guru yeah i think i've seen part of an episode or two so he had a, a video recently where he talked about having a a a journal of medicinal plants and their uses. Yeah, keeping a journal. I've, that would be cool. I've noticed that around here there there is a couple of different programs that I get Facebook notifications of that do like activities. Unfortunately, most of them tend to be like kind of expensive. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we, we and we did a few nature hikes a few years ago with with some guides who kind of told, talked a little bit about medicinal plants and their purposes. So one of the things they do is they had a news, a daily news report that the buskers did where they they made up a pantomime or a play that talked about what was going on. Right. It sort of summed up the game so that everybody was on the same page and knew what was happening and what had happened the day before and what the plan was for the next day, like to keep the game advancing. Right. Uh, and some some of them were seems very clever. Right. There was this whole plot line in which uh, one of the bandits who was in the forest 
was trying to maneuver to become king. He also claimed to be able to raise the dead. And uh, so he sort of defected from the bandits and was trying to join their band. And so the buskers put on this little performance about all of these bandits who were trying to befriend them uh, and pantomiming each one of them and saying, do we trust him? Right. I kind of wish I, I wish there'd been a video of this because it sounds mm -hmm. really cute. Because the overarching narrative is it's a it's Robin Hood and the Merry Man in the forest. Right. So, forest. so Isabella's character she made up is her name is Elizabeth. Right. And her mother died when she was a baby and she grew up with her father and her grandmother in a little cottage and with a garden. And her grandmother was a healer and a midwife and she was teaching Elizabeth about herbs and medicines. And then her, the king's men came and arrested her father for a crime he didn't commit. This is all out of Isabella's head. And her grandmother died shortly thereafter, and Isabella was left as an Elizabeth, rather, was left as an orphan and eventually was turned out of her home and so joined this band of children who had also been turned out of their homes for various reasons, who have then been sort of taken under Robin Hood's wing to which is right out of Robin Hood. It's right. Right, right out of the story. Yeah. And and so there's there's like a guy who plays Robin Hood and there's a guy who plays little John. I have to say, I'm amused by the name. So, so Isabella takes Elizabeth because, you know, it's it, it's her name in a different form. But the other other the other girls were Athena, Katniss, of course. Of course. Uh, there was Bree, Wallace Bruce. And she said nobody could remember if his name was Wallace Bruce or Bruce Wallace. Maybe he was Wallace the Bruce, sort of like Robert the Bruce, kind of mixing them together. Right. Uh, Reaper was another one. So you could see you could see the the personalities on display in the names. Right. You could see the, the Percy Jones fans and the Hunger Games fans and the, the various thing influences on the kids as far as where, where they were drawing right. their Isabella their hasn't from. read Hunger Games or Percy Jackson Jackson, not Jones. Percy Jones. Percy Jackson, Jackson. the Lightning Thief. Oh, yeah, I haven't yeah. read those either. <laughs> <laughs> uh Sir George, Patch, Frederick. Frederick was the uh the one who wanted to be king. Yes. Uh Frost, Marshmallow, and Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> right. And those were just the names she could remember. She, she'd yeah. forgotten all, some of them. There was a, a good-sized band of kids who were uh, part of this. I mean, it's just, I, I, so I read this narrative, and you know, she's, very, she's very good at writing. That's just the clear. She's gotten that from her mother. And, it, and, <laughs> and her father. Uh, okay. So, uh, I, yeah, I suppose I'm a, I'm a decent writer, too. But um, it, I just enjoyed reading the adventure she had and realizing that Isabella is an extrovert. Uh, I like. I think she. No, or, no. she's she's she's, she's not a, shy. She's not. Shy. She's an outgoing introvert. Right. That's right. Okay. That's a better way of thinking. Yeah, she she's she's outgoing. She she dropped into the situation. She knew three of the kids and one of the adults there before she um before she joined in. And she, and it was I sort of dropped her off in the morning at nine o'clock and she was there until two thirty and she was fine. She's not a wallflower. That's the thing that gets me is when you drop her into a situation, she doesn't hold like I would when I was her age. I I, I stood yeah, back. I, I, I would have been. And you. Hanging, yeah, you're the same hanging, way. Hanging back. But Bella jumps into the middle. And I just love it's, that. about it's, her. It's great. Yeah. And this was the most uh, sustained piece of writing that she's also done. Uh, I made her a condition of her going to this this camp that she had to every week write up an account of what she had done that week. Right, since because it was four Thursdays. Right, and it took it took the whole day off of school, so she wasn't doing any schoolwork that day, and she was kind of honestly shot for work the next for doing schoolwork the next day too. Uh, so she was usually recalling these like she would she wouldn't work on it until like maybe the next Monday or Tuesday. And yeah, sometimes she would be rushing to finish it up on Wednesday in order to be able to, <laughs> to be caught up by Thursday. Um, but we didn't really do any editing until after she'd done her last Thursday. And she wrote about a page per day. Right. Yeah. Um, and so then we sat down over the course of a couple of days and pro did a lot of proofreading and editing and revising. Um, because some of her her initial draft was pretty sketchy, and she was really a joy. Like she was much more fun to work with in terms of she likes editing, right? And I I taught composition in the college level for several years, and so I've and none of those kids liked editing. Well, I had one or two, one or two, right. one or two every semester. Yes, 
the ones who made, who made but, it all but, worth it. Yeah. But Isabella would have been my teacher's pet if she'd been in one of my composition classes because she's really a joy to work with as a as a writer. I think getting to work with you is also part of it. Just like she's now doing math with me every morning. It's it's fun. Yeah, I, I love writing. I love editing. And it's it's fun to have her share th that passion. So. Uh, so, yeah. So hopefully this is something that she and maybe the, some of the others can do at some point in the future if they ever do this again. This was a test run. They're uh, they're hoping to get a program up and running in September, and we haven't heard back like as far as details. So that's kind of up in the air. Okay. We'll see what the schedules are like. But it's it's I mean it from my point of view it, it's a it, it seems like a successful what what it's trying to do it's doing. I mean I, I really it's really kind of neat. Um, so the other thing this new is actually it's an SQPN thing. So SQPN, which is the network that this podcast is on, uh, in which I'm run. Uh, has a new podcast called American Catholic History by our friends Tom and Noel Crow. Uh, they're friends we stayed with in Steubenville when we were on our cross country trip last uh, last fall. Right, and we we stayed up we stayed up late after we tucked the kids into bed talking with Tom and Noel about this they idea had, for a they podcast. Had, they wanted they to do had. a podcast, yeah. and it was a great conversation. Like I by the I didn't want to go to bed because I kept wanting to hear about these great ideas that they were throwing at us. Right. Tom had worked on the American Catholic Almanac. He had helped research the book and had come up with so much material for it that he just he wanted to do something with it and maybe not and a lot a, of stuff that didn't even fit into the book. Right. Exactly. This is almost all of the stuff that he's he's got is, is he had only like about 10 percent of it fit in the book, I think he said. And and so they suggested that maybe they should do a podcast. And we talked about, well, what kind of format would it take? How long would it be? How often would they publish? How would they do it? Would he just be one voice? Would be two voices? And so we talked about back and forth and over time. And I really encourage them. And, and we, they put a lot of work into it. We did like four or five different tests and, uh, and all kinds of stuff like that. And they've got some help from a friend out there recording it. And we've just launched American Catholic history, the podcast uh, it's sqpn.com slash history. And it's every week, about eight to 10 minutes. They, they, they tell a story from Catholic history, American Catholic history. So the first one was, about this woman called Margaret Howery, who is uh, a, from New Orleans in the 19th century. From Ireland, who moved to New Orleans. Right, from Ireland, moved to New Orleans, was a widow, uh, and she, she was known as the breadwoman of New Orleans. She was a v successful self-made businesswoman, and she fed the poor. She was known for feeding the poor, taking care of orphans, uh, taking care of the widowed. Yeah, we listen, so we listened to the podcast with the kids, and... They were all wrapped. They loved it. And and by the end, uh, Isabella especially was saying, you'd better subscribe to this, Mama, so we can listen to all the episodes. Uh, so right. it it was definitely a hit with, with not just with Dom and I, but the kids loved it, too. By the, by the time you hear this podcast, the second episode will be out, which will be about uh, Father Anthony Coleman, uh, who, who in 1813 had was put on trial in New York City uh, for for the seal, the seal of the confessional. Uh, Ooh, that sounds yes timely and fascinating. <laughs> exactly, and uh, and 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 it this sort of sets a, pre a legal precedent for protecting the seal and how he was. It was Protestants who stood up to say that it should be protected. Wow, uh, and not just because Catholics minority, but because of the principle for of religious freedom. And when you when you, it's really interesting when you really listen to how it gets laid out. It's I mean, again, I'm I'm really enjoying this podcast, not just because because it's on my network, but because it's really, uh, really good content. And I really want more people to find it. If you're a homeschooler, definitely. I mean, this is a great uh, supplement. If you're just someone who's, you know, interested in, in history or you're Catholic, any of those things, even even if you're not American, uh, you know, our friends who do the Catholics of Oz podcast were saying that how much they enjoyed it. Uh, they're Australian because yeah. they're from Oz. Well. I mean, I like to learn about like Australian history, so why wouldn't they like to learn about American yeah. history? Yeah, in fact, I maybe encourage them to add a segment on Ooh. Australian Catholic history. Australian Catholic history, I would be really fascinated with. I, I know very little about it, although I do know that there is one Australian saint. Yes, uh, um, Mary McKillop. Mary McKillop. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, very nice. Yeah, just recently uh, canonized. Almost said ordained. <laughs> so what else is yeah. so what else is going on? Um, one of the things we were talking about is there's some there, when we moved to our neighborhood, there were not a lot of kids. In fact, I think we had the only kids on our street uh, as well. 
there were older kids like Amy next door. Right. The next the next door neighbors had a an eleven. She was like eleven or twelve when yeah. we moved in, and Bella Bella really latched onto her, and she she. But Bella was her. like four. Right. Three. She three. was three. Yeah. So, but she called her my friend Amy. Yeah, it was cute. Yes, and Amy was nice to her. But Amy is, you know, what is she now? Twenty two. And yeah, yeah, you know, and head doesn't live there anymore. But um, so we have these na- a couple neighbors up the street who have since moved in, and uh, so there's a family, an Lebanese family, you said, um, or something like that. I, I talked to the mom like more than a year ago, and I remember she told me that she was. They were both immigrants from two different countries, and I, uh, I no longer. Let's just say where. somewhere in the Levant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so from that area of the world. Although I think she might have been Brazilian. Oh. I'm not sure. Like. Oh. So not the Levant, but no, no. I think he was, and she was from like South America. Okay. I don't, I don't know. That's interesting. Anyway, actually. Uh, and then there's a they've there's, got a, they've got a passel of kids. Yeah, four or five, either three. I don't know how many kids. Um, but there's at least a, one boy who's a, probably about what six, seven, six. Uh, the one who looks like uh, our nephew uh, Jacob. I, I think he's more like four or five. Okay. You're judging him next to Lucy, who's six, and she, but she's... She's, she's taller than she is, but he's right. like four or five. Yeah. But yeah, he, he, I mean, like, he's like a twin to my sister's son, Jacob, and it's uncanny. I wanted to take a picture of him and send I, it to Evie, but I felt kind of creepy about doing that. I, I, I think that he was actually a, a toddler when they first moved in, because I think I sort of remember him toddling down the sidewalk, and I think it's the same kid. Okay, all right. So so him, and then there's a another a elder, a older couple whose grandkids, like their 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 uh, daughter and son-in-law, I think, have moved in with them with their kids, who are, so a- Ava is four. I think they told me that she's uh-huh. four. She's really cute little curly, curly blonde-haired yes, girl. Yes, headed little Very precocious. And their brother, uh, his, uh, I forget his name, he's a couple years older. So They're uh, very sweet. And so they've been coming around, and then they have an a older brother, and there's some other older kids. Frankly, I, I prefer our kids to play with the younger ones because the older kids have all the issues of what they're a little rough. They're rough preteens. Just, just our kids aren't used to rough playing, right? And, and they're not used to negotiate like schoolyard negotiations because most of the homeschooled kids they they hang out with are kind of more laid back. Well, by example, last October, a couple of kids, a couple of the kids from the other side of the the, the block, came around wearing the scream hood and mask. OK, and we're in the driveway and I kind of you know, said hello to them and they wouldn't speak. And they would just like make like noises at me. And I'm like, OK, yeah, very funny. It's time for you to go now. Like it was just it was really kind of creepy and rude. I thought uh, it wasn't very respectful of an adult. But so anyway, so the so these kids are younger, but they still <laughs> they still don't have the social niceties yet. Yeah, they they kind of have a tendency to. Well, not only just like they knock on the door and sort of wanting the other the kids to play. Yeah. And when I say, I'm sorry, we're kind of busy right now. Why? <laughs> yes. Why? And then and then today they, they I, I said that the kids were busy because we were still doing schoolwork. And uh, so they went. They went around to the backyard and started climbing on the. The, the, the dome, dome the, the in the playhouse. Yes. And, and, I, and I had to stick my head out and say. I'm sorry, can you please not play in our yard and when the other kids aren't out? <laughs> so we've had to establish a couple a couple of rules, it's, basic it's, rules. It's a little bit hard to establish yeah. boundaries for people who aren't your kids. With, with li- so with little ones, well, any kids, my I, I just, I don't feel comfortable having them in our house without their parents. Unless I know the parents. Like our friends, like you were talking about before, like, like if, if Xena dropped off Emma to play with Lucy, you know, if, if the, you know, if, if that was something that she wanted to do, I would be comfortable with that because I know Z- Jeff and Zena and, you know, that right, sort of yeah. thing. Uh, if but I don't know her, their parents and I, it just it and I, I don't want my kids in their house. I mean, just the way the world is now, I just don't feel comfortable with it um, not from a liability issue or even just just other, you know, the other stuff, which I, that doesn't bear talking about. But um, so there's that. But then there's the but talking about the, the social niceties. I'm making burgers for our family for dinner tonight. And and the, the boy comes up and goes, can I have one of those? I'm like, nope, these are for our family for dinner. Why? I'm hungry. <laughs> well, if you're hungry, you can go home and get some food from your parents. <laughs> yeah. N- 
if if we knew the parents and like they were we were sort of on a more comfortable social level with them, I I might not feel so weird about well, feeding their well, kids. But I might invite them over for dinner if they're right. If they're, like in a, in six months or a year, I might invite them in for you know say can you go ask your mom if it's okay for you to stay stay for dinner with us. That would be something. But like they've only just met these kids. But the funny thing is how our kids react to them. Like they like playing with them sometimes, but but like Ben very clearly said to me. Sometimes I just wish they wouldn't come over. I don't want to play with them all the time. They they haven't quite figured out how to uh who say um I, I don't really feel like playing right now or you know I'm I'm doing something else. Right. And you know I I remember being a kid and the, there was there was the little boy down the street who who would frequently come over and and knock and knock and knock and knock and knock and knock. Was that the one that your dad said you guys were eating the Easter Bunny for dinner? Yes, yes. <laughs> that was when I was in high school. I I made rabbit for uh for Easter dinner one year, and yeah, Dad told the little boy that uh, that you were eating Easter. We were eating the Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, it, it's not really just a, it's not really exactly a home homeschooled kids or sheltered issue. It's just sometimes kids don't know what to do with the kids who don't really have boundaries and are yeah. kind of unintentionally pushy so but so between scouts and more kids moving in the neighborhood there's a there's a little boy across the street now and there's more kids moving in i think our kids are getting more chances to and like bella's going to adventure camp more chances to make friends with other kids their age which i i like I think yeah when we good. first when we first moved into the neighborhood i think most of the people who lived here were the original owners these houses were built in the 50s yeah so they like yeah they were they were here for 60 years a lot of these people 15 60 right years. so they were you know grandparents and and slowly they've things have started to turn over yeah naturally <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the sweet little lady uh who lived next door she passed away. She died yeah. last last uh, year. And then we have Ruben who lives next door. Ruben is a fun our fun neighbor who's uh moved from the city, but he's originally from Puerto Rico, moved here from twenty years twenty years ago and very personable, very friendly. But it, it's his first time living in the suburbs, like he's lived in the city. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of like fun watching their yeah, family figuring things out. <laughs> like welcome to suburbia. Exactly. Which is the funny thing is because on the other side, like Amy's family. I have never met her. Like, we've lived here for 11 years, and I've never talked to her mom or her dad, like the mom or dad who live over there. I yeah. see them, but they don't wave. They don't say hi. I mean, I kind of, hey, like, nope, nothing. I feel weird. It's been 11 years. Now it feels awkward. <laughs> like, hi, I'm your neighbor next door. Like, anytime yeah. I've dealt with them, I've either dealt with, like, Amy, who one time brought Bella home because she snuck out through the fence when she was little. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or their son when their fence fell over and he came over to fix it and, and that sort of stuff. Right. It's kind of awkward. So anyway, neighbors, what are you going to do? So let's talk about what we've been cooking. Um, we've had, so we haven't gone anywhere this week, but we've had some interesting dinners. Uh, last Saturday, uh, well, so a couple weeks ago, I'd mentioned I'd seen something online about making, or actually it was in the paper, about making non- pizzas on the grill like so not not non pizzas non the indian flatbread right uh so you bought some non at the store um cuz frankly it's just as good from the store as w whether we I, could actually, make it i i've i've made it myself a few times and the stuff from the store is maybe even a little bit better yeah i mean you i suppose with time and in and experience you might it might get I'm, better i'm an okay baker but plus also it's summertime I don't Nobody really want to... my oven oven yeah. on a lot. Right. So it was it was it, first time doing it. Um, some of them were a little toastier than others. A little. Some of them were a little yeah. overdone. O overdone. Yeah. So uh, I, I, a little learning curve, but I fi I'm figuring out. My sauce was really good though. The sauce was good. So you basically throw it. You you oil it. Olive oil on both sides. Throw it. You, you build a two level uh, fire. You know, coals on one side and no coals on the other, and uh, throw it over the coals for a minute flip it another minute get some grill marks on it and then um then you put the sauce and the cheese on uh and on the cool side and let that melt and then um that you take it off and you could you could throw like we had like a arugula we could throw on yeah. or tomatoes I, I think we should have put them on at the same time as the sauce and cheese yeah that maybe like i i know you like to have it a little cooked though a little bit yeah yeah um so but the kids kind of liked it they didn't like it as leftovers 
Yeah, they they weren't they were not as thrilled with it as as they've done. as regular pizza. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I I want to try it again. I do yeah, want to try it. Again. I, 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 and I, it again. I think they'll I think they will like it if we try it. Again. You know, I I think that what the selling point might be letting them put the sauce and the cheese on for themselves. Yes, yes, that that next make time we own, will do make that. your own pizza. It'll be make your own pizza because make yeah. your own food thing is which is what the next thing my brilliant idea. <laughs> so. What what was it we had left over? We had oh we had leftover salmon. We had had salmon la- last Friday, and we had a bunch left over for whatever reason. I think because we'd had it with pasta, and uh, also, they put the bun pasta. Also, this was the the sockeye the sockeye salmon, which was a little bit more fishy tasting. It was stronger, and I think I overcooked it a bit. Okay, so maybe so, yeah, maybe it was. It, I, it, I liked it, but it 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 wasn't the favorite. Yeah, it was on sale, uh, so we were able to pick it up for a song, and yeah, but. So we had a bunch left over and I'm thinking, well, I was going to make a, I was going to make a salad and then put some uh, fish on it, you know, the, 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 for lunch. And I thought, eh, the greens don't look all that great, but we have a ton of rice in the fridge. What if I made a rice bowl? So what, so I, I, I got some rice in there. I put in celery, ra- uh, slight dice up some radish, cucumber. Um, what else did we put in there? Sesame seed, sesame Avocado. oil. Avocado was the best idea. That once I put avocado in, salmon and avocado was brilliant. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I I added some uh, sriracha, uh, some nori. We did it when we did it later again. But so anyway, the long and the short of it is, the kids saw what you were doing, and they they didn't know what they wanted for lunch, and so they said, "That looks interesting. Can I try it?" And before we knew it, all five kids were having rice bowls for lunch, (laughs) and it tasted like and they all. The, the fun thing was that they all they all kind of wanted slightly different combinations of vegetables. Anthony likes bell peppers. Ben hates bell peppers. Ben likes avocados. Anthony hates avocados. Mm-hmm. And so they were all able to custom have a little customized bowl. And I said, this is brilliant. We could do this for dinner. Any meal where they get to customize, where they get to put the build it tacos. Uh, what's the what's the soup that we make that? Oh, the tortilla soup. Any meal where they can where they have a hand in constructing their bowl or their plate. Yeah, is is a number one best I is is the the and stuff that we've like done like fried rice where you add like toppings before, but this mm-hmm. is right. And it wasn't fried rice because it's a that's hot. You, right, know, you, you have get, to stand over the walk over the walk. It. Yeah, this is a, you know I take leftover rice and you nuke it for a little bit. You know, I mean it was add, add a little bit of water to keep it yeah. from being too dry. Right, of course, and then nuke it. And then nuke it, yeah. but but you know it's it's a good use for leftover rice. But the, the flavor actually is fairly similar to fried rice because you're still adding the sesame oil and the soy sauce. Right, exactly. So a little bit of fried rice, a little bit like fried rice, a little bit like sushi. Like like I, I the way I, when I made it, it tasted like spicy tuna rolls or spicy salmon roll. It was really good. So we decided to try it again the next night with for, leftover pork chop for dinner. Yeah. Um, not as successful or was it i mean it was still pretty it was still really good i I think a the avocados had all gone bad right and so the the avocado eaters were a little bit less thrilled um yeah and uh pork chop was a little strongly flavored for the grilled chops was it uh i thought it was good but maybe maybe for the kids i'm trying to think of what was what was different for them um yeah i'm not sure and maybe they just weren't all that hungry or yeah or they had just had it and it, the novelty wasn't there. And so give them a little time and they'll be interested again. So it was that one. And then we had the chicken the next night. We had chicken salmoriglio, salmoriglio which was a, a dish, a recipe I found on the Milk Street Kitchen. It's a Sicilian uh, grilled chicken with lemon and uh, a lemon uh, sauce. So you, you, you marinate in lemon and garlic, but then you also serve it with a sauce of uh, lemon and Parsley and it's kind of else. almost a a parsley pesto. It was a kind of a, a parsley pesto. Yes. Yeah. So so the long and the short of it is Anthony really liked the <laughs> he was the, putting it on everything the, the parsley pesto sauce. Yeah. Uh, he put it on his pasta and he put it on his chicken and he he was a huge fan. Everybody else thought it was too strong a taste, including yeah. me. I it was too strong. Yeah. For me. I liked the grilled chicken. Yeah. The. The grilled chicken was okay, but, and and honestly, the pasta I made, I made like a pasta with the uh, lemon and artichokes and peas and mushrooms, and it was only okay. It 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 missed something. I missed the mark. 
Yeah, it was it was a similar dish to the one the, the pasta dish we made we made a week before, but we changed a few things. And I wonder what was different. We have to go back and look at that, see what was different. Well, the other one had uh, cherry tomatoes, and this one didn't. And they pistachios. Had... Did you put pistachios in this one? I did put pistachios. Okay. Yeah. The, the difference was I instead of cherry tomatoes, I used ma- sautéed mushrooms, and it just it missed something. Okay. It Maybe needed the, the acidity. The acidity of the, of the tomatoes, I think, was the is the big the big difference yeah. there. Yeah. The brightness of that. That might have been that. That might be worth trying again with the tomatoes. Yeah, but sometime later because i've had way too much pasta recently <laughs> yes well and my uh, doctor has just recently informed me that i need to stop eating as much uh pasta and, and rice, rice as i've been eating so that's that's yeah <laughs> we'll do a little less we were doing better for a while and yeah honestly the 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 grocery store has their vegetable section has been kind of lackluster recently and we're waiting for the farmer's market to get the good height of summer vegetables right everything so. is delayed because of the spring rains and that's just we just haven't had the good stuff yet yeah. there's a lot of greens a lot of like leafy greens but not not much beyond that at the market yeah, yeah. it's kind of sad yeah. so i i'm feeling kind of lackluster in terms of cooking <laughs> so uh so that's what we've been uh, cooking so what have what's uh what's been entertaining you melanie what have you been doing that's been entertaining uh well I actually haven't been really watching much. I'm still creeping my way through Brideshead Revisited, and I'm still creeping my way through uh, the short stories of Rosamund Hodge. Um, nothing really new. Uh, well, mo- what's been occupying your time then? <laughs> Mostly what's been occupying my time is a project I set for myself at the beginning of the year, which was to write more poetry, um, especially to try to work on more formal poetry, poetry that... Uh, uses rhyme meter and you know sort of forms and i've written poetry most of my life but uh i got kind of scared away from rhyming poetry at some point and uh i'm trying to get back to to doing it again Mm. so i've been checking out books looking up writing prompts online and and trying to sort of get into a regular habit of writing as opposed to just writing when the inspiration strikes but and, you 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 had something that really has become a prompt for you, right? Something. Right. So our our Facebook friend uh, John Harrod, who's a an artist um, and graphic designer, I think his his day job is doing works for Ignatius Press, uh, book covers yep. and book design. Uh, but he also is a painter and artist. So he started a new Facebook page called uh, JR's Art Page, and he shares several times a day. Uh, fine art, you know, mostly paintings. I think uh, that's in the public domain, and I've I follow several other Facebook pages which share fine art. There's one that's called I Require Art, but there's something about John's paintings which have really become an inspiration to me. And for the last week or so, I've been writing one or two poems a day based on paintings. Or if I'm not writing a new one, I'm working on revising one that I, a rough draft. And I've been doing a lot more of the hard work of revising poetry as opposed to just like the muse strikes and I write down of what I, what comes to me and then it's done. Um, This is much more work, but it's satisfying. And you can see the final result of many of these at the wine, your Melanie's blog. But so, uh, I, I I'm enjoying the paintings because they're different. They're it, they're 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 not like modernist or whatever, but they're they're just a, an artist artists that I've not seen before, right. um, who are really good and really like the the Japanese artist who's just this master of light. It's just amazing. And then I've 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 come to know the uh, this artist Carl Larson who was Swedish, uh, and did a lot of beautiful domestic paintings. Uh, his wife was a designer and created this beautiful home. And uh, they had a huge passel of kids, I think like eight kids, nine kids. And so he he has a series of paintings that he had done um, of her and the kids. And just just basic domestic events, just just life. Right. So there's one of the, the parents having their quiet evening after the kids are in bed. And there's one of her reading a story to a child who's sick. And there's one of a girl who woke up late after everybody else and is having a sad, miserable breakfast. Well, the others are while outside. the others are playing. <laughs> playing. You can see in the background a little, a little 
girl with a red jaunty red beret going out the door. And and she's got the sour expression sitting at table. Yeah, it was those good good pages. I mean, there's just I mean good art. Uh, so uh, Jr. Jr.'s art page is is that one, and you also can find the link on Melanie's blog when you look at the art. And so then another of the uh, pages I've 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 discovered. Uh, in a, you've maybe heard of National uh, Novel Writing Month. Well, evidently somebody did a National Poetry Writing Month at some point, and I found a page of prompts that somebody had published to to kind of get people's juices flowing for a national poetry writing month. And I, even though it's no longer national poetry writing month, I've been going through the prompts. Would that be Naporimo? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Naporimo. I like that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> one of the prompts I was looking at, uh, they usually do like a video clip, uh, watch a video clip, read a poem. And then, you know, they give you a prompt of like, something to get your juices flowing like you maybe write something based on this prompt and one of the video clips that they did was from groundhog day you know the the classic bill murray comedy so i went and watched the video clip and then of course youtube being what it is it suggested more groundhog day clips and i found myself going watching more and more clips from the movie and then finally i actually went over to amazon prime and rented the movie and watched the whole thing from <laughs> beginning to end because I really love that movie. It is a great movie. It's a it's a brilliant movie. It's a brilliant message to the the that in the end his joy comes from not trying to escape from the life he has and not or not trying to take advantage of the so-called libertinism, the libertinism which he thinks is freedom, but to do good in life even when it doesn't seem to matter. Right. And he, he sort of it becomes this like life of service, but he, he, um, he spends all this time making himself a better person. Really. He becomes his own self-improvement project because, well, he actually, before that he hits the skids and he, he kills himself multiple times because he's so depressed. And the, the thing is that every single day he wakes up and it's groundhog day again, even if he killed himself. Right. He's he still wakes up. So eventually, and he can remember all the previous attempts. It's not like he wakes up with a blank slate. He wakes up remembering every other Groundhog Day that he's lived over and over he and over again. Sunny and shares. I got you, babe, on the clock radio. Right. There's a great sequence of him like smashing the clock radio <laughs> after a while because he's just so sick of that someone, song. Someone tried to calculate how long he was. Yes. And the the conservative estimate. um, it was hundreds of years. Or longer, even. Well, no, I mean the conservative estimate was like, like the the quickest possible. Like if you sort of did the bare minimum of time, would have been a couple of months. But I think yes. they they sort of assumed that it was at least ten to fifteen years, but possibly longer. Well, given that he learned the, the things he learned to do, like play the piano to the level he was, one day at a time. The, the right i mean they kind of assumed the the people who who estimated 10 to 15 years that i was looking at that he learned how to play a couple of songs on the piano like maybe he wasn't you know broadly versed but right. he, he learned how to you know knock a couple songs out of the park nevertheless he spent 10 to 15 years in what essentially is kind of purgatory right it, it i think it, i think it is very much a classic movie of about about purgatory where you he is he's purged of his attachments to this life which but is what, what i purgatory. what i love about the movie actually my, one of my favorite scenes is he's trying he, he's fallen in love with andy mcdowell's character but of course she only knows him for a day she's only known him for a day every single time but he gets to know her deeply and intimately and he's at one point he's trying to uh convince her to stay and he's trying to convince her, for, for one thing, that, that this experience he's had is real, that he's living the same day over and over and over again. And he goes through this diner where they're having breakfast, and he introduces her to every single person in the diner. And he knows them very well. He knows their backstories. He knows what they like, what they dislike, what their hopes and dreams are. And it's this like beautiful moment of community. Because and they're all shocked because they don't know him, and they don't know how he knows all this about well, and he contrasts with his character at the beginning, who was arrogant and didn't and just disdained all of these small town people as unimportant. Oh, yeah. And... He, he's a self-important jerk at the beginning. Yes. Although 
charming and funny. Like, he, right. He even in the beginning, he's funny and you kind of like him, but he's, he's sort of a likable jerk. Yes. Ned. <laughs> Remember Ned? <laughs> Ned, the insurance salesman. Yes, that he went to school with. Yeah. Uh, but it's but it is it's a great movie. And I, I was really glad to watch it over again. I, and and I was able to go in when I was in college to Punxsutawney on Groundhog Day. The Punxsutawney. Was uh, it fun? It was fun and not at all like the movie, like nothing like the movie. <laughs> See, I, I assume the movie was kind of not like what it was like. Well, the town in the movie is the, is the same town from Back to the Future. Is it? Oh, yeah. That town square is the Back to the Future town square. I did not notice that. I'm going to have to go watch it again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Punxsutawney itself is a is a Pennsylvania coal town industrial. And the and, and Phil the Groundhog is at the sportsman's club on the edge of town. Oh, that's and nothing. Nothing like the movie. Whereas in the movie. So do they actually have like a big party? Like do lots of people show oh, up? Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's basically it's two parties. There's the overnight party that all the, the, the drunken college kids go to. Uh-huh. And then the what I went to, because I was not a drunken college, because I, I was a grad student at a Catholic, very nice Catholic school, Stu, uh, Franciscan University of Superville. So we did we we showed up for the morning. So we got up very early and drove there. Uh, and that's the family part of it, where um, families come out and they see the, the, the groundhog do his thing. And the Today Show was there. That was, wasn't Al Roker. Who's the guy before Al Roker? I... The weatherman? Who, I no fig- idea. I forget who he is. We used to do, like to call it the hundred year old birthdays and all that sort of stuff. I forget. Uh, it'll come to me later. But uh, but it was very nice. And then everyone goes to all the different like churches and Elks Club and all the different places that have pancake breakfast. After, oh, which that was, sounds kind of nice. Yeah, it was. It's a, it's a it is an actually a nice time. So it, it's kind of kind of fun. So but Groundhog Day. Yeah, it is one of my favorite movies. But so it was a prompt for poetry for you. Well, I didn't actually end up writing a poem at all on that prompt or oh I, I think I wrote something like just sort of a throwaway draft of something but it had nothing to do with the movie but it I just be... I the movie I was a rabbit trail I fell into <laughs> it would be interesting to hear a uh, your, uh, you read a poem about uh, the, that was inspired by that movie though that would be interesting it's a good prompt I would say I have to say that yeah and, and I don't remember what exactly the prompt was it, it wasn't really about the movie it, it, I don't know oh, okay I'd well, have to look at it again. Uh, what I've been watching is what uh, pretty much I guess everybody's been watching, which is this HBO miniseries called uh, on Chernobyl, called Chernobyl, uh, the the nuclear disaster, which I remember from when I was a kid. Yeah, I remember that happening. And it was uh, scary. It was very scary. And then reading about in what, the years since. What, what year did Chernobyl happen? Uh, I think it was eighty five or eighty six. Okay. Something. It was mid eighties. All right. Uh, I, don't, um, I, I could really quickly Google it or ask Alexa, when was Chernobyl? Alexa, when was Chernobyl? It's something I found from the article Chernobyl. Okay. Alexa, stop. Yeah. 1986. 1986. Live here on the... So I was... 12? Yeah. And I was, that was, was the end of my senior year of high school. I was 17. So it was, I mean, it was scary because this was a nuclear disaster. I mean, watching this movie and, the, you know, hearing them talk about it, there was, we were 48 hours away from the, the build, the, the nuclear power plant exploding with the force of, you know, something like 50 megatons. It would have catapulted all of that radioactive fuel into the atmosphere and rendered uh, Eastern Europe uninhabitable. Wow. They said like 40 to 50 million people would be displaced from their homes. The, 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 the places where they would want to live, like Belarus and Ukraine, would be uninhabitable. That, I'm very glad that didn't happen. Right. I mean, yes, it is now. Um, there's this huge exclusion zone around. Remember that? Uh, the 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 website a few years ago the it's like a guy who like it was a girl on a motorcycle road motorcycles rode through the exclusion zone taking right. pictures and showing what what pripyat and the chernobyl area look like today i mean people they showed the, uh, the i watched the second episode and they showed like they evacuated they finally evacuated the city and just like buses pulled up into the city everybody got on the buses rolled out like 
people walked away from the food on the table and that's... laundry on the line. And, it's, and, it, and it, that stuff was there for years afterward. Yeah, that's really... I mean, it was apocalyptic. Yeah, kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, but the movie is really good. It's, it's interesting because it starts... Is it a movie or a miniseries? I'm sorry, miniseries. It starts... There's no real prelude to it. It starts with the disaster, with the explosion that starts everything off. And it doesn't spend a lot of time really explaining the story. It doesn't explain the Soviet Union. doesn't really, you know, doesn't explain who Gorbachev is. You just have to know that who Gorbachev is. I imagine that might be a little bit disconcerting to people who are younger and don't remember it. Well, in fact, I've been noticing, I've been seeing on, like, on Google and other places, trending, like places where people ask questions, trending uh-huh. questions. What caused the Chernobyl explosion? Who is so-and-so? And what was this? Interesting. Yeah. Because when people are trying to find out. That's the kind of thing that, like, I know, as I've I've watched Isabella get really interested in the last part of the 20th century, because, of course, none of the books written for kids really cover cover, cover that. She's right. like, so what exactly happened? And, and I'm having trouble finding resources for her. I found a few books here and there. But after World War Two, there isn't a lot of history books written for kids. Yeah, it's really kind of weird. There's like the there's nothing really for the Korean War, the Vietnam War, which again those are all wars, I guess. Well, there's like there's some things here. And JFK. There. There's a little bit of JFK. You'll find stuff about the space race. There's that. But it's actually the the second part of the twenty twenty the stuff that I I remember. Like I can't find anything about like. You mean the stuff from like the eighties and nineties? Yeah. The last two decades. Right. Like the like my my childhood and my teenage years. There aren't books for kids about the end of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, uh, like the you know, our 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 involvement in Afghanistan and the Middle East. Uh, well, that's really Saddam the 21st Hussein. century. <laughs> well, 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 OK, the, the first Gulf War, you mean the first yeah. Gulf War? Like like she's like, what is this Gulf War thing? And I'm like, oh, I did a scrapbook about that in high school. Oh, wow. So to me, that's like. That's like history that I remember, that's, and so, for her, it's ancient history that she... That's like 30 years ago. Right. <laughs> Just that's the back for a second. can't... That's like 30 years ago. But I'm not... I mean, I have sort of the... I lived through it, but I couldn't really necessarily explain it very well. When you were, when you were 13, what was 30 years ago to you? I was 13. I'd see that was... 1955? Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was 13... It was, yeah, it would have been 1950. So, yeah. It's pretty wild to think about. So, 1990 to Isabella is like 1955 is to you. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, that's ancient, that seems like ancient right. history. Whereas, what, even when I was in school, the, the textbooks did World War One, World War Two. They hardly did World War One. They did World War Two, and then they stopped. Right. You might, like, have a little, like, sort of chapter in note about Korea, Vietnam, and then mm-hmm. that's pretty much it. Yeah. In fact, I was always frustrated in high school history that when we did American history, we never got to World War Two because the teacher never you couldn't keep pace. And we ended up like getting to the Great Depression and stopping like we always stopped at the Great Depression. We never got to. I always wanted to know, learn about World War Two. So I ended up reading a lot of books I, about I think, World War II. I, I sort of I think we I had a teacher who skipped World War One so that we could get to World War Two and at least get that <laughs> out of the way, because I don't really know anything about I, I learned about World War One from like the books I read to the kids. For me, but my history teacher probably remembered World War Two from when he was a little. Really? Wow. Uh, well, so my freshman year history teacher, he definitely did. He had been teaching when I was when I had him. He was like forty. He had been teaching for forty years. So he was a teacher during World War Two. Right. My my high school <laughs> my high school history teachers were all pretty young. He, one one of them was like. He he actually went back and got his law degree. He was like right out of college, yeah, teaching for a few years. And and another one, she'd been teaching maybe for ten or twenty years. Like she was. This so, guy had taught my friend's mom. Yeah, my <laughs> yeah. You know, she she this this one had, well, her daughter was in my class, so she was like a mom, but not a right. grandma. But this was um also ancient, ancient history. Right. So the guy who taught. The guy who taught U.S. history, I think he was probably, I think he probably was old enough to remember the Korean War. Uh, I would guess on that. But still, for them, this was all, this wasn't ancient history. This was, you know, this wasn't history to them. It was just stuff from when they were kids. 
So I think that's what I think that's one of the things that happens is that we forget that this is actual history to the kids and forget the yeah, the and, to, and, to teach but them I also about think it. that there's I don't know there's this lag with books for written for kids like I think that you have to have a certain distance almost in order to translate these things which seems so very adult to us to a to a child something that children can process and understand because of course you want to shield them somewhat from the horrors of war and yet you want to give them a sense of the sweep of history and I think maybe we need a little bit of distance ourselves before we can translate that for kids maybe okay right. that's my theory all right so um so that's what i've been watching and then we we, we both watched the first episode of the uh third season of jessica jones you missed the second season of jessica jones i liked the first season a lot and then when the second season came around i, I wasn't really sure that it didn't sound very compelling i really loved what i really loved about the first season was well david, david Tennant. Tennant. <laughs> I, not just because i like well okay i am kind of a david Tennant fan girl fan girl but also his character was so good kilgrave was so creepy and interesting like the it's a powerful supervillain, and how will you ever defeat someone who has that power? And right, I mean, it was a really interesting dynamic. And I know you were watching the second season, but I was watching something else. I don't even remember what. And Holy Bones. <laughs> no, this was before Bones. Uh, this was before Bones. Called the midwife or something. Probably. I don't know. Yeah, and second season, and not as good as the first. And nobody, nobody was telling. Like, like I knew several people who were watching it, and nobody said, "This is so good, you have to watch it." I, I didn't feel like I was missing out. Yeah. And then maybe the third, I wasn't right. Well, the, there was kind of a, it was kind of a mess, to be honest. It, it was there was no clear single villain. Um, she was trying to find her origin story. Yeah, there was a conflict with her best friend, Trish. There was a, there was something with her mother who turned out not to have really been dead, but then is some kind of rage monster. I, and then the scientist who turned them into what they are and all this. It was sort of unfocused. I, I like super villains. Right. They, they give they give you some focus. Right. Uh, this season, so the first episode is really just kind of catching up with where Jessica is at. Um, there's some nods to yep. political correctness, which are annoying. Uh, and then it was interesting, but it wasn't super yeah. compelling. I didn't feel like it made me want to watch. And she's been, episode. yeah, at the end of it, she's hired to find her friend Trish, who's been as opposed, missing. As opposed to like, in contrast, Umbrella Academy. Where after I watched the first episode, I had to watch the second episode, like now, <laughs> and then the third episode, and like. We we didn't binge watch it. We didn't watch the whole season in one night. Yeah. But, but that was mostly just because I knew I, that I had to, like, take care of the kids the next day. If right. I was young and single, I would have stayed up all night and watched it. Yes. If it were your, your sister, we would have. Right. She would have watched was, it, all it That was an incredibly compelling yeah. Yeah. show. I agree. Yes. And I can't wait for the well, second season. Yes. I mean, the, what they did to it, it to the end of that uh, season was just yeah. like the twist. And then, uh, yeah, so. The th the thing is, this is the last season of Jessica Jones. There, it's all of the Marvel stuff on Netflix is going away because of Disney's new streaming service, and and which is Marvel, and so, and then the the actress, something Ritter, I forget her first name, uh, is, who plays Jessica Jones, has pretty much said that she's done playing Jessica. So, uh, this is it. So no more no more Luke Cage, no more Jessica Jones, no more Iron Fist, which I don't think anybody will miss. And uh, no more Daredevil, probably, which is that's really disappointing because that the second season of Daredevil was not as good as the first. The third season was really good and really dealt strongly with religious topics in Catholic faith. Yeah. And that's another one. I watched the first season. I think I watched the second season and then I I bowed out because the second season was kind of boring. You should watch the third season. I should. I you should, should go back and watch because it, it was season. good. Yeah. All right. So that's what we've been watching. So um. I think that's enough for tonight. Uh, we, we've got some interesting stuff coming up in the next week. We've got right. the 4th of July coming up. Oh, that'll be fun. We'll be your, your brother time. always throws the best 4th of, 4th of July pool parties. Yes, he does. Yeah, it is, uh, he, he, his parties are epic. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, tomorrow night, as we record this, is a surprise party for my sister-in-law, Carol, uh, which uh, for her birthday. It's a landmark birthday for her. And um, it's, I'm not ruining the surprise because I'm not releasing this until after the party. <laughs> so uh, I can't ruin it. But there's plenty to talk about there because of the whole surprise party and my parents uh, surrounding that. That'll be fun. That'll be an interesting discussion. <laughs> so there's plenty to talk about next time. So we hope you'll join us. So 
that's it from us. What did you think of our discussion of the various things that we've done this past week and the things we've been cooking and the things we've been entertaining us? Uh, so let us know. You can go to sqpn.com slash bets, B-E-T-T-S, or to the uh, SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia, and leave feedback there or send an email to bets, B-E-T-T-S, at sqpn.com. And uh, if there's any links or anything like that uh, for our show notes, you can find those at sqpn.com. Please, if you can, I would greatly appreciate it would help us grow the audience for the podcast. If you could go to iTunes or you know, the Apple podcast app or wherever you're getting your podcast from, like Google Play Store and write a review, uh, you know, a nice five star review would be nice. The <laughs> reviews are used by these directories to, to say when they start seeing reviews, they start recommending the podcast to people. Hey, this might be something you might like because people who like this also like this. So if you could do that for us, I would really appreciate it. And, or if you could just share the podcast with your friends, like on social media, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, email it to them, let them know about it, that this might be something they might like. Uh, we'd really appreciate that because we really want to grow this community, reach more listeners. And it's, uh, that's really what it's about is reaching, reaching people and making friends, new friends. So I'm really uh, hopeful that we can do that. So until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. 